to what I have in my notes. It actually, uh, I'd, I would actually like to start with something I heard uh, Chris say a week and a half ago on a Thursday. He mentioned the word oppor opportunity. And, and it witnessed to me because when the pastor asked me, do you want to speak on, okay, if I can say Easter Sunday. I, I can also say Resurrection Sunday if you want. You know what I mean if I say Easter Sunday. And I thought, wow, yeah. I mean, I think I, before he even finished, I said yes. And then as I thought about it, I'm thinking to myself, and, and I'm not, sh I, this is in no way uh, portrays a lack of confidence on my part. I thought, wow, Easter Sunday. Okay, I've never, I've never stood up here behind a pulpit on an Easter Sunday. But really, what makes this day greater than any other? Well, actually, quite a bit. But from a, from a uh, standing behind a pulpit perspective, it really is just like every other Sunday. God's the same. Uh, he doesn't love you more today than he did last week, you know. And, and every opportunity, Chris, like you said, is an opportunity to, to do something for God, you know. Uh, knowing this, God will do something for you. Now, I, I'm not going to do something and say, you know what, this is what I want you to do for me, and this is what I'm going to do for you. I don't think I have to say that with God. I can just go ahead and do something, and you know what, God? Surprise me. It's like getting a gift. If, can you imagine if every time you got a gift, you knew it was in the box? You know what you'd finally say? Do me a favor, don't wrap the dumb thing. I already know what's in there, you know? Well, God's like that. God's full of surprises. So, let's see. Brother Chris, Paul's missionary journey. And I got, I got on there. Thank you for the opportunity. I wonder, if, uh, I wonder how many times Paul said, Thank you, Lord, for that opportunity. I don't think I've ever been hit that hard before or, or spit on. Or, but he still counted every opportunity. He still counted every, every instance where he was able to, to, to do the work of the Lord as an opportunity. So anyways, getting back to having the jitters a little bit, which... I really don't. I'm, I'm trying to see how I feel, and I, I'm not really nervous, so that's probably a good thing. Might be bad for you, but. So I went to the dentist this week, expecting to get a tooth pulled. And uh, very nice people. It was a new place I went to. And uh, the doctors, the, the dentist aide said, are you nervous? <clears throat> about this. I don't know if you ever look at it this way, Brother Bud. I said, I had my chest cracked open five years ago. I said, getting a tooth pulled is probably like getting a slap on the wrist when I, when I used to go to school. So she goes, oh, okay, well, we just wanted to make sure. So uh, judging by the clarity of my voice today, I didn't get the tooth pulled. So. Uh, Let's see. I seen a billboard. I had to, I had to make a, a delivery to a customer in Connecticut. And I was on 291. And I seen a billboard that said, take care of your body. It's where you live. I don't know if any of you have seen that. Every day. And I thought, wow, you know what? I can meditate on this all the way to Connecticut. Stop and think about it. You guys know me as Irene's husband, an elder in the church, Daniel Stefaniak, but that's only because of this, of this show. This is what I look like, you know, and you associate that with me. What did Paul say? Paul said, I know no man after the flesh. And that really is what God's interested in. You know, I, Paul wasn't interested in your physical appearance. I want to see what's going on inside of you. That's the important thing, because we can dress this up. We can make it look like something it's really not. 
And until you open your mouth, people really don't know who or what you are, you know. But God's chosen each and every one of us. You're not here by chance. Jennifer and John Cody, Cody, the hardest part is coming back here the first time. The second time will be easier. And then by the third time, well, it actually doesn't even take that long for the people to welcome you back. This is a church that you can go for five years, come back, and it's like, ah, oh, we missed you. No. You know, slobber all over you. But that's how it's supposed to be. Because whether you, fall, whether you fall for a day or fall for a year, in God's eyes, it really don't matter. God's concern is that you get back up. You know, and I'm not saying you guys fell or anything. Uh, you have been missing out on an awful lot. A lot of interesting stuff. So pay attention. You might catch up a little bit. So this is the deal. The billboard. Your body. The body that God has selected for you. I want to read you a quick scripture and then we'll go on. In 1 Corinthians, uh, 1 Corinthians, I'm sorry, it's in John. I'm, I think I'm ahead of myself already. John 3.16. Nope, ah, forget it. I picked two scriptures, uh, John 3.16 and 1 Corinthians 3.16. And, and I kind of started messing up between the two of them. They're both, they're both equally good. So let me start with 3.16 in 1 Corinthians. Do you know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? I'm not going to read the rest of it. You know about defiling the temple and what God will do. So that's, I mean, that's equally important, but I want to keep this as positive as I can because I know that I'm speaking to a positive group of people here. So you're the temple of God. The Spirit of God dwells in you. In order for you to become a temple of God, in order for the Spirit of God to appear on the scene, there was a great price that was paid. It, it had to be paid. Because at one point you were not a temple of God. You were not the God that we presently know, anyway. So now we can go to 3.16. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have, e but have everlasting life. And, and in my footnote, this is what it says. God gave to us first. He is our role model for giving and receiving. Do you find it difficult to believe that you should expect to receive back from your giving. Read again this most famous verse in all the Bible and notice these things. One, God so loved. God's motivation for giving was love. Ours must be too. God gave. God's love was turned into an act of giving. And three, God gave his only begotten son. He gave his very best. So must we also give our best. God gave for a specific reason, to get back, to get man back from Satan. God's deepest desire is to have man restored to himself and to get that need met. He gave. What is your need, your giving, as an act of your deepest love and strongest faith, is the key to your having that need met. God gave sacrificially. Our salvation cost Jesus his life. It also cost us. Full repentance and the giving of our lives in God. Not quite as hard as his giving was. God's plan works. Souls are saved because God gave his best. Gave first and gave expecting to receive. God himself is our role model for giving and receiving. So that's what today's all about. God's giving and God's receiving. I 
And I have over here, aren't you glad it's recorded in his word? Jesus spoke in parables. Okay, this, this doesn't necessarily apply to what I'm doing right now, but a parable is a wise saying using only a few words. Okay, I probably already exceeded those few words, but only, listen to this now, only profound meditation will reveal what is hidden. The meaning of the word profound as an adjective concerning a subject or thought, demanding deep study or thought. That's what I found myself doing this week. Leave me alone. I want to get by myself. Meditate on a word and don't let anything distract me. You know, I don't want to think about work. I don't want to think about pro projects at home because you know what? When I'm done here, those projects, projects are still going to be there. You know? We had an interesting, we had an interesting men's, uh, men's meeting last month about prioritizing I hope I don't read this twice I have it in my notes and this is what I started doing I would find myself doing something at work and more and more over the last week or two I stopped I stopped doing that thing I say you know what this is not important I have other things that that are more important, that are at higher up on the priority list. And I asked my wife to do this. I'm not, I don't want to make any negative confessions here. Don't ask me to do something if I'm, if I'm already doing something. I'm, I'm very easily distracted, okay? I, I recognize that as a big weakness in my life. It's very difficult to overcome. If I have three things going at one time, I can guarantee you pretty much neither one of them are are going to get done. Or it's a true story. It is, it's, it's a true story. I have to put a lot of effort into it. Now, I was excited listening to Josh. Uh, he was talking about ADD and medication and, and how the neurotransmitters all of a sudden from one side of your brain to the other are firing back and forth. They're communicating. Now, maybe something in the back of my head, maybe I got, I, I understand when I was little, my, my brother flipped my carriage over and I fell out of it so I'm thinking maybe something separated in the back someplace and it never quite reattached properly but at any rate God's able to God's able to overcome in realizing your weaknesses are very important in your life as long as you know what they are you can either focus on them more intently ask somebody for help Walk around with a notebook if you have to. I, I read that the other day. If you're, if you're subject to missing appointments, start writing stuff down. We have so much. We, we have overkill now as far as our, our, our laptop, our, I almost said tabletop, our laptops, our cell phones. There's no reason to, to have to succumb to our shortcomings. So anyways... So when you hear a proverb, it demands deep study or thought. So, I noticed this Bible is long gone, but my wife gave me, when she gave me my first Bible, Proverbs 25.2 says, It is the glory of God to conceal a thing, but the honor of kings is to search out a matter. Okay, it's an honor... Glory belongs to God. He loves concealing stuff in here. Nikita um, said something today. He said there was a word. I don't remember what the word was. It doesn't really matter. That uh, there was something grossly, I'm not sure if, if misdefined. Misdefined, yeah, that would be a word. That something, was, something in the scripture was grossly misdefined. And, and he would have never realized it if he hadn't looked it up to realize that it meant something that he read actually meant something entirely different. Okay, that's one of the nuggets in the scriptures that God says, you know, let me put this over here and see if somebody can figure it out. Yeah. God's like that. God does that. Uh, study to show yourself approved. What do you think that means? That's finding them nuggets. Yeah. Okay, so this word search 
The honor of kings is to search out a matter. Oh, by the way, I was going to bring in a prophetic word. You know, I was going to spend a little time talking about prophecy. I'm not sure how many of you remember some of the prophetic words that you, that you have. Uh, Ronnie's terrible. Ronnie, you know, somebody will mention a prophetic word from like six years ago. Ronnie will say, oh, yeah, I remember that. You know, I, I, but, but I do, so when I had the opportunity to do it, when we still had cassettes, I would write down prophetic words. And I remember uh, Phil Capuzio giving, giving me a prophetic word about, number one, that God gifted me with the abilities that I have at work. And I believe that totally. And I, I mentioned it several times to you that I thank God. I just did it last week. I did a job at work. I said, thank you, Lord, because I know that that wisdom that, that, wisdom that I have in this trade comes from you. So give God the glory for any opportunity that, that you have. But Phil Capuccio, in his prophetic word to me, said, you're going to hear, you're going to hear preachers that are going to agitate you. And the reason that they do is they'll read something and throw a few words out and provide very little proof text. You know, like me and Brian used to say it every once in a while, like, you know, well, why don't you go get saved? Okay, well, you know what? That's like a, life, a lifetime thing. You don't just make a decision that you're going to get saved and... You know, I'm still in a process of being saved. I don't know about you, you know. So, so this word, search in a concordance, it's uh, hakar, and it means to penetrate. Hence, to examine intimately, and the result being to find out. And I know Tim likes when I do this. It comes from 2714 which is haker. It means, God always does things in three, doesn't he? It means examination, enumeration, and it means deliberation. <clears throat> examination, the numerical value, this I thought, you know, I, I, I started to look this word up. Examination, look what I found. The numerical value of examination in Chaldean num numerology is three. Can you come up with a better number than three? You know, the Godhead. In Pytha, okay, I don't know what Pythagorean is. I, it sounds like a race of people or something. In Pythagorean numerology, it's the number eight, which is new beginnings. Okay, we know what examination is. Huh? Well, Scripture is very clear on examining yourself. Examine yourself. Do an enumeration. A detailed account in which each thing is specially, is specially noticed. A detailed account. It's like reading the scriptures. Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized. Okay, go through that whole thing. There's, there's hidden gems in the scriptures. You've got to find them. You've got to look it up. You're not just going to, you know... Uh, Irene was talking to somebody the other day, and uh, uh, I would say they're in a baby, uh, baby Christian state, and they're reading the book of Revelation. And Irene said, no. get out of the book. Yeah. You know, there's other things. Not that God can't give you revelation out of the book of Revelation, but uh, I think she said, Read the book of John or, or one of the gospels, you know, the, the other gospels. So a detailed account in which each thing is specially noticed. And deliberation. How many of you heard that term, deliberation? A jury deliberates. Okay. Careful consideration of weighing, of weighing and examining the reasons for and against the choice. It's, we need to deliberate on a daily basis in our own lives. Okay? This is what you do when you deliberate. I have this choice before me. What am I going to do? Let's see. Am I going to do this? Am I going to do this? And behind each one of your choices, if I was back in school, which I didn't like school, you could come up with a list. Okay, if I do this, this is what I get. 
if I do this, this is what I get. All right? That's what happens during your deliberation. In another place, it says it's a vote. You're going to vote on it. You, got, you have voting rights, you know, by the way. God said vote. You can vote on it. You know, your vote is the most important. In your life, your vote is the deciding vote where you're going. You're going to vote on life or you're going to vote on death. Am I going to choose this tree or am I going to choose that tree? Absolutely. And who said it the other day? I don't remember where I heard this. There's trees popping up all the time. All the time, there's a new tree sprouting up. So your, cho your choices of choosing the right tree get a little bit more complicated as you get further and further into your walk with the Lord. Okay, having said that, I want to start reading in Luke chapter 19 and verse 1. And I want you to remember this. Things are not as they appear. Never. Don't, don't ever... Don't ever think that your first reading of something is the way it is. Nikita hit it right on the head today. You better look that thing... You better look that thing through because the meaning of something more than likely is going to be different. And let me tell you what else God does. You may read something one day... Go back to it a year later, and that thing take, takes on a whole different meaning. So it's, that's, what, did, what did Paul say uh, about repeating the same thing twice? It's not grievous. It's not grievous because I may say something that triggers something in your life. Maybe the last time I spoke this to you, it really didn't pertain to you because of the, some different situations that you were going through in your life. But this year... It's something new. Maybe Paul, Paul used to, yeah, the seasons change. Maybe if I mention something about a, a shovel in snow, but I'm not going to do that. Okay, so in Luke chapter 19, verse 1, and this is a, mes this is a message. This, is, this message actually has a list of things. I was going to write them all down, but uh, this is a message of salvation in Luke chapter 19. It's a message of salvation, number one. Number two, you're going to learn that Jesus always listened to the Father's voice. Okay? Number three, God never gives up on anybody. Nobody. Nobody. God does anything unless he has a purpose. Okay? You'll never see him, you'll never see him wandering off and, he'll, and saying... Well, let me go down this path here, and I'll see if I can bump into somebody that I can do something in their life. God has a plan. There's a scripture that I always try to find that uh, I think it might be in Ezekiel where God says, shall I have a thought and it not come to pass? That means that God's got it. I mean, I'm sure God is very careful. He says, I can't think that. If I do, guess what? It's done. It's a done deal. That's basically what God is saying. And, and we should be the same way. We should have purpose. Purpose to make sure that we're, what we're doing is what God wants us to do. So the scripture starts off, Then Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. So the word enter here, enter, entered, means to penetrate. Where do we just hear that? Search. Search. So what was, what was Jesus doing? He was on a search. All right. He wasn't looking for Easter eggs. He was looking for, he was looking for people. All right. It means to penetrate. It's 1525 in the Strong's. The definition is, listen to this now, to enter in for an important purpose. It's prefixed with the Greek word ice, which means the point reached or entered of place, time, or purpose. Okay, it was a perfect place, it was a perfect time, and he had a perfect purpose. That's why he went, he, he entered into Jericho. And then it goes on to say further, doing so to experience the result 
of the Lord's external blessing. Cedars, if you're following the purpose of God, there's always going to be an external blessing. If there isn't, then you probably follow the wrong purpose. Or maybe the blessing is still not for that season, and you may not see it for, I don't know how long, God's economy could be 50 years, but uh, the, the, the most important thing to do is always hear the voice of the Lord. That's the most important thing you can do. Make sure that what you're doing, you hear from God. I don't care, I don't care if, it's, if it's ministering to somebody. You've got to make sure it's their time, it's the right place, and that's what God has purpose for you and for that individual. I already said that. Said that. I'm getting your priorities in order. Okay, so Jesus entered and passed, or was passing through. Passing, he pa it says here that he passed through Jericho, but if you look in a concordance, it, it actually states that he was, he was in the process of passing through. The word is 1330. Dirkom uh, Ahi. Whew, man. Some of these words are tough. Going through. Okay, that's what he was, he was going through. And while he was going through, this word also means to spread as a report. I think that happened every time Jesus went out. Every time he went into a city, report of him just spread through. I mean, it, it was like wildfire going through. The crowds were already gathered before he even got there to spread as a report. The news was spreading. Jesus was in town. Verse 2, now behold. Now I was going to yell. I don't want to yell today. But that's what that word means, behold. What it, what it actually means, uh, one part it says, lo, lo, L-O. Another part it says, don't miss this. And I did actually yell at home when I said it. Nobody was home. I probably scared the dogs, but. But that's when you, I want you to, to think. Next time you, you crack your Bible open, look up the word behold. Because more than likely, it's going to mean don't miss this. Don't miss this. There's something special happening here. You can't miss it. Okay. Behold. It's, two, it's 2400, and the word is idu. Calls attention to what follows from it. It comes from 2396. Ide. It literally means be sure to see. Literally, don't miss this. Don't miss this. That word, I looked up the word behold in a concordance, and it's in there numerous times, numerous times. And I think what God is saying, and I think we already all know this, God's saying, you reading this? Don't miss this. Brother Bud used to have a, his favorite, Selah. Think about it. Pause for a minute. Something's being said here that's very important. Don't miss this. There was a man named Zacchaeus. Oh, this guy's got some issues. He was a chief tax collector. Brother Barry, be gracious. I know you don't like him. You don't like tax collectors. I don't either. It's not their fault. They're only following government orders. A chief tax collector. The scoundrel. I actually wrote that down here. There was another problem, too. He was rich. He was rich. What does the scripture say about being rich? Oh, you ain't got a chance. There's no chance for you to enter. In, what is it, a camel and a needle? An eye, of, an eye of a needle. Then for a rich man. So this is where the, my, favorite, my favorite part was because that tells me, okay, and I already knew because I... Like Brother Varner, I went to the movies. Jesus had his eyes set on him. Matter of fact, everybody in town knew that he was a sinner, too. He was a sinner. If you look up that word sinner, he was missing a mark. That's what he was doing. He was missing a mark. 
So he was a chief tax collector. He was rich. He was missing a mark. The word named, okay, now behold, there was a man named, Zacchaeus, is onoma. It means the manifestation or, or revelation of someone's character. Okay, so your name has a lot to do with your character. Now, my thought was this. If you don't like your name or you can't find it in scriptures, don't worry about it. The book of Revelation says we're all going to get a new name anyway. So for now, you're stuck with whatever you got, you know. But I'm sure if you look hard enough, no matter what your name is, you're going to find something that it originated from in the scriptures, you know. As long as it's not Satan, you're all right. <laughs> According to Hebrew notions, a name is inseparable from the person to whom it belongs. That is, it is something of his essence. You know what, you know what the name, I don't know if you, anybody ever looked up the name Zacchaeus. You know what it means? You got to do some studying to find out. Pure and innocent. Isn't that awesome? Okay. He was a tax, tax collector. He was rich. His friends said, what is Jesus doing with him? The guy's a sinner. Okay, and yet his name meant he was pure and innocent. The word rich, ah, here's what, I think here's what God is looking for. Rich, which we probably, th I thought it was maybe to have a lot of money. And it could be, you know. But if you look up the word rich, it's 4145. It's plusias. It means Abundance or fully resourced. He was fully resourced. Okay? I mean, he could, have had, he could have had enough money where he could have done anything, or, or God looked at him and said, this guy's got everything. I can get the job done with this guy. Matter of fact, we sing this song all the time. His love never fails, never gives up. So regardless of, of who you might think about or who you might bump into out there, God loves them, and, and God can work with people. God can do anything with anybody. Nothing is impossible. In other words, he had what it took to get the job done. And then it says... And he sought to see who Jesus was. He sought to see who Jesus was. This word sought means required or demanded. That's what this word sought was. He just wasn't curious about, man, who is this guy that's passing through? You know, they claim he's a miracle worker. He, he made a demand on himself. I, I got to find out what this guy is all about. The word Jesus, as you all know, Yahweh saves or Yahweh is salvation. The who word here means who, which, what, and why. Those are some of the questions that Zacchaeus had. He had many questions, but because of the crowd, he couldn't press in because he was of short or little stature. Pockets must have been bulging out with all the money he had because he was short, too. And it made me think, if Brian was here, he would chuckle at this because we had a guy who used to work at our shop. I'm not going to mention any names. He would always have like $3 worth of change in his pocket. It's like people, you know what aggravates me when you're talking to somebody and they got a ballpoint pen? I just want to slap it out of their hand. This guy would put his hand in his pocket. And just so happens I got quarters in my pocket today. So <laughs> You're talking to the guy. I don't care how long you're talking to him. He's doing that. God, get rid of it. You know, you'd almost want to reach in your billfold and say, hey, you got change for, for a five? 
make it all quarters and dimes and nickels. So, so Zacchaeus had another problem. He was short. Guess what? He wasn't short. Well, well he could have been. He actually he could have been short, but I don't know if you I don't know if you guys heard the latest on the astronaut that was up in space for a year when they measured him. He was two inches taller. Two inches taller. So the higher you elevate yourself, in more ways than one you actually sh shrink less. So the forces of gravity, things on earth will really drag you down, won't they? Okay. All right, so let's, let's I never seen a picture of Zacchaeus anywhere. I don't, know what he, I don't know what he looked like. But from what God showed me, he was not short, okay? And let me tell you why he was not short. The word stature here comes from a Greek word. It's helikia, helikia. Elizabeth would probably come up here and do a better job at this than I, than I would. It's a DNA word. It's, we get the word helix out of it. Okay? And it, what it means is the end, the end stage of a full lifespan. The end stage of a full lifespan. So he wasn't really sure. Unfortunately, he was at the end of his life. Okay? That's what his problem was which is probably why he couldn't, it's, the issue wasn't that he couldn't see above the crowd, he couldn't keep up with the crowd, or if he was like stuck in the middle someplace and he couldn't make his way through. But I'm, I'm going to read something too. He made an effort that got him out from, from amongst the crowd. Okay, but first I want, I want to provide you with another scripture to show you how, how faithful God is. This same word for, for stature here, is found in Hebrews 11, verse 11. Listen to this. It's going to blow your mind. By faith, Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed, and she bore a child when she was past the age. That word age is that word stature. That's what it is, same word. So this guy, Zacchaeus, he was past the age where people probably would have, some people that don't know the power of God would have thought, too late for him. You know, he's a tax collector, he's rich, he's a sinner, you know, or he's gone. He ain't going up that way. The NAS, I guess that's the New American Standard, yes. translates it as, the proper time of life. So when you have an encounter with God, any time is the proper time of life because God ordained it that way. So that person that you might be ministering to out there that seems like they're receptive, receptive guess what? It's their proper time of life. God ordained it. He has a, a plan and a purpose for him. So this is what Zacchaeus did. So he ran ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree. And the first thing I thought of when Fran opened his mouth today when he came into the church, he said he's going to climb up a tree yeah. this week. Now, if you know what happened to him, he, he suffered a lot of damage. I really believe God delivered. I, I have to believe that God delivered him from a lot of the conditions that he was going through. But it took trust in his, on his part. Now, I'm not going to say anything about you climbing up a tree. Okay, that's entirely up to you. I'm encouraging you to hear from the Lord. Make sure that God says that, you know, Fran, I think you're ready to start climbing up the trees again. You know. The Lord will guide you. He'll guide you. He will guide you. You know. Uh, let's just hope he doesn't have to catch you up on, on eagle's wings. Amen. Yes, he will. And it's good to see you again. I'm glad you came out. Uh, I know. I do want to tell you one thing. Zacchaeus climbed up a sycamore tree. A sycamore tree is approximately 20 feet tall. So it's, it's not like he, he climbed up an elm tree. Maybe, that's a, maybe that would be words of wisdom to you. Start off, you know. All right. 
we'll leave the sycamores out of it. All right, so this is, what, this is what he did. So Zacchaeus ran ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was going to pass that way. The word ran here means to outrun, to beat the pack. Of course, I thought of Chris. To beat the pack. And that's what he did. Now, I'm going to tell you what, it probably wasn't easy for him, especially if he was, uh, of, let's say, mature, mature age. You know, probably well older than me. But he kept himself in shape, which goes back to my billboard thing. There's somebody in here. This is the temple of God. God expects you to take care of this temple. You know, take care of this thing. It's not only for, oh, I don't need to take multivitamins. Well, maybe you don't. I don't know. That's up to you. Anyway, I don't want to get off on that. All right. So the word here means to outrun, to beat the pack. He climbed up or ascended, moved to a higher place. He had to move up to a higher place. All right, I've got to get away from these guys. Number one, I've got more money than they do. I probably can't trust any of them. And they think I'm a sinner anyway. So. But he had a plan. See, God, when God has a plan for you, God puts a plan in your heart, too. All right? And that's why when somebody comes to you and starts to talk about the Lord, they're just not curious about what church you go to. The Holy Spirit's doing something in their life already. So that's why the scripture says, be instant in and out of season. Now that word, it's, that, act, that scripture actually has a whole other meaning to it, which I don't want to get into because it's not part of my notes today. Okay, and the word to see means behold, consider, perceive. Properly means to see with physical eyes, physical eyes. Guess what it does when you see something with your physical eyes? It naturally bridges to the metaphorical sense. The word metaphorical, when you think of that, you think of what? Like metamorphosis. Okay, it changes. When you see something, it changes. Don't, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Don't ask me to explain that. But when I see something, it's, it changes into an image that gets recorded in my brain. It's like, okay, you think the camera was a, big, was a great creation? God already designed that. We just can't print, print, print stuff up. Oh, but you can actually do that, too. You can paint something, an image of something that you have in your mind. So, in effect, you are basically a camera. Okay, so what you see with your eyes naturally bridges to, to um, in a metaphorical sense, perceiving, mentally seeing, seeing that becomes knowing, then is a gateway to grasp spiritual truth from a physical plane. You're seeing something in a physical plane that's being changed around in your mind. It gets into your heart and you begin to get built up spiritually. Spiritually. We see with our eyes, our minds are activated and our spirits are fed because we see God working in the midst. How many times have you seen God working in the midst of somebody's life? And it just so encouraged you. It just wanted you to press in deeper and deeper. And that's what happens in the church. That's what happens in the body here. Let me tell you something. If, you're, if you happen to be, you know, and I know joints get broken down into smaller sections than what I'm going to talk about now, but, but if you were a left leg in this church and you seen the right leg working out and building up with muscle, you know what you would do? You would want to you would want to keep up with that leg because let me tell you something, you know, you, you would need to, you would need to. The, the whole pack has to travel together. That's why we have to encourage each other. We have to encourage each other in the Lord, okay? So, so I'm actually done with my notes now, so let me finish reading this. So he ran ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was going to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must stay at your house. Whew. So he made haste and came down. 
and received him joyfully. But when they saw it, they all complained, saying, He has gone to be a guest with a man who is a sinner. I encourage you to look up that word sinner. Then Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, I give half of my goods to the poor. Half, okay, half of my goods. Okay, forget the 10%. I'm giving half. And if I have taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore fourfold. What's that? Is that isn't that like, Brother Bud, isn't that like double, triple? Double doubling, what the word actually requires for you. So now I'm, now I'm, I'm restoring fourfold. And Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house because he, is, he also is the son of Abraham. For the son of man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Okay, that's actually the end. What time is it, Irene? Almost quarter up. I can finish in the next two or three minutes. Uh, this next part here, I wasn't going to really get into it today, but Nikita said something in Sunday school that said, you know what? It, go, it, it, it was a lot. It was actually, I was going to say, it really wasn't that much they said about my, you know, that fit into my lesson. But all he had to do was mention the number 10 to me. That's all he had to do. Because this is what 10 represents. Would you say uh, 10, was, 10 was the least amount of uh, people in a city, or at least that's where the conversa conversation ended at 10, that God would pour out his salvation. So 10 is a very important number. Listen to this. Listen to this next part. First, first I want to tell you that the word parable has a few different meanings. Here's one of them. Parable, to throw alongside. To throw alongside. To liken or compare. So you just heard everything on Zacchaeus. Now the next part of, of this chapter is a parable. It's, and and this, is what, this is what I thought of. It's like a row of something. And, and Jesus takes and just throws another row. Oh, God, I, miss, I used to go bowling. Anyways, uh, Jesus throws something alongside, and he says, okay, look it, I just gave you a story right here, and I'm going to throw this parable up, which is going to make it really simple for you to understand. And you're going to have something to compare it to. I wonder if that's where we got our word comparable. Comparable, probably, huh? To throw alongside. So listen to this now, the parable of the minas. Okay, so now having heard everything that was said about Zacchaeus, verse 11 says, Now as they heard these things, he spoke another parable. Because he was near, okay, this is why he spoke another parable. He didn't have, he didn't have the time to go through a whole explanation again, and I don't really know how long it took him to do that. So he, he says, you know what, I'm going to have to cut this short. I'm going to give him a parable, which is like really easy to understand. And what happens when you hear a parable? Hmm. You start to meditate on it. Yeah. Okay, now as they heard these things, he spake another parable because he was near Jerusalem. He was almost at his next point of destination. The deal with Zacchaeus, it was done. Okay, next. There was another plan. And because they thought the kingdom of God would appear immediately. That's why he threw the parable out there. Because he was near Jerusalem and because they thought the kingdom of God would appear immediately. So whatever was said in there, in that first part of uh, chapter 19, led them to believe that, oh man, you know what? The kingdom of God is like almost here. So, and he's probably thinking, you guys are way off. I'm going to have to really you know, throw you out another explanation. So this is what he said. Therefore, he said, a certain nobleman went into a far country and I bet you I left my other note at home, but that's all right. A certain nobleman 
went into a far country. Who do you think he's talking about? Himself. He's talking about himself. Nobleman, a nobleman is somebody of high rank, high stature. Forget the other stature I told you about. Age has got nothing to do with Jesus. He went into a far country. Listen to this. I mean, this must, this, you really got to meditate on this in your spare time. A certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. Isn't that, doesn't that blow your mind? Really, when you think about it? He's telling them, I'm going into a far country to receive for a, ki a kingdom for myself. And guess what I'm doing? I'm bringing that kingdom back. That's what he's saying. Now, who ever heard of such a preposterous thing? If you go, how can you go someplace and, and inherit a kingdom and then bring it back with you? He was the kingdom. He was the king. He became the kingdom. And to, re, re, and to return. So he called ten of his servants. Ten of his servants. Delivered to them ten minas. And said to them, do business till I come. The word business here in another translation is occupy. Does anybody ever say to you, would you just go occupy yourself? Well, that's basically what he's doing. You know, my dad used to give me 10 cents when I was a little kid. Back then, 10 cents used to buy you an ice cream cone. Here's 10 cents for crying out loud. Go buy yourself an ice cream cone. Okay, well, I don't know how much, how much the minas are worth, but I imagine it's enough for me to go out there and do business. And what kind of business was he talking about? He wasn't talking about transactions. No, I used to say to myself that, you know, God was into finances, but... Probably isn't the finances too, but God's more interested in, in counting people than he is, you know, counting dollars. So this word 10 is significant here, and I'm going to tell you why. It fits right in with the first part of that chapter, and Nikita mentioned in Sunday school. If there's 10 people in this city that are worth saving, guess what? I'm going to save the whole city. That's what God's interested. You know what else 10 represents? And this is you guys now. God gives you a mina, you know. I don't know where you'd, have to, where you'd go to spend it, but, but, but say God gives you, a, a, like in the other chapters, it talks about talents, okay? We, we know we all, have, we all have a talent. There's nobody in here that can't go out there and do something for the kingdom of God. I'm not talking about work. I'm talking about being beneficial to the kingdom of God. So if, and for sure, if, this, if he's talking about himself, and even if he's not, a nobleman is going to have more than what? Ten servants. A nobleman is probably going to have thousands of servants. But the significance is that he chose ten for a reason. Ten represents what? The law. Represents the law. Represents what? Tithe. Re ten represents the tithe. And tithe requires what? Faith. Faith on your part. Because God doesn't want you to give till you're broke. You don't have any money at all. You have to have the faith to know that God is not going to allow you to well, beg in the streets, I think it says. Beg for bread. What else does 10 represent? The plagues. 10 represents the plagues. These are all important things in the life of a believer. You have to know. You have to have discernment to know what's going on in the kingdom of God. And God sent each one of these, these guys out Gave him enough to, hand, to, to do the job. And if I had my notes, I could, if I had my other notes, you would not believe some of the things that, uh, like the word occupy. The word occupy means a whole lot more than just keeping yourself busy. It's, it's not only transacting, transacting, but it's also, it also has a lot to do with lives of people. Okay? And God knows that what the scripture says about money. Money answers everything. Money answers everything. And God knows that you need money. So it's never bad for you to say, God, just bless me, Lord, as long as you know you're faithful in your job. If you're not faithful in your job, guess what you're going to get? A, a big Easter egg. <laughs> That's what you're going to get. But if you're faithful in your job and you feel like you're not, there's nothing wrong with you praying for, for God to bless your, your finances. Okay? Now, I could probably ramble on for another 15 or 20 minutes. Uh, 
maybe longer if I have my rest of my notes. But I want to say something to you. God's got a plan and a purpose. One other very important thing that you have to remember. You ain't, you ain't the only one in your household that God wanted to save. God wants to save what? The whole house. The whole house. Did, did, isn't that what he said to Zacchaeus? Today, your household, your whole house, everybody in it. Nobody's got to be left out. We're going, to spend, we're going to spend time with family members today, or at least I hope you are, and eat. And you know, when you're eating with somebody, Nikita can come up here and, and finish this. When you're eating with somebody, that's an intimate thing. You're, you're maybe only partaking of food, but let me tell you something. If you feed a stranger, you can speak into his life. You can, you can if you ever took in a homeless person, He's trapped, at least until the meal is done, you know. But that's how, but that's how it is. God allows you to, to sup with somebody for a reason. There's a purpose and a reason for everything that happens. There's a reason why you're gathering with, with loved ones today. If you have any loved ones that aren't saved, say something about Jesus to them. If we're going to be as wise as serpents, surely you can, you can come up with something that What's that word? Stealth? Now, you don't have to be sneaky about the things of God, but some people are not very receptive sometimes unless you are. And you can, t you can minister to people, and they don't even know. They just, you ever have somebody say to you, oh, man, I, just, I felt so good when I was with you the other day. We were just talking about stuff. It felt so good to, you know, to be with you. Let's do this again. Okay, don't wait a year or two to do it again. But I want to bless you today. I want to encourage you. Speak to those that you love. If you love them, drop a, drop, drop a, pray to, pray to God that God, you know, Lord, just tell me if, are they purposed in your plan? Okay, well, number one, if they're part of your household and you got saved, you don't even have to ask that. God already has a plan and a purpose for them. So why don't we stand? We'll close in prayer. Thank you, Lord. Father, we just thank you for your, your word. Father, I thank you specifically that you've revealed some of these nuggets to me. Lord, it just, it was so good, so good to search some of these things out. Hallelujah. Lord, just touch, touch the hearts of this people, Father God, to a degree where there'll be so much there that just, they'll just want to pour it out on somebody. Even as they gather today, Father God, to break bread with their family members, to sup with them. Bless that time, Father God. Bless that time of meeting, the time of eating. Let your name be glorified in the midst. And Lord, as touch lives, Father God, as only you know how. Lord, you do it so you, you do all things well. We thank you, Lord, for those that came out today, Father God. Lord, bless each and every one of them as they leave. In Jesus' name, amen.